Before we get onto the, all the details about MRI in the bulk of the talk, I do want to just touch on CT and what are some of the clinical things that, that, that we use it for. So really, CT is great for the bones. Very high resolution. Um, you remember it's a density measuring machine, so you have the very high density bones versus much of the middle ear mastoid um, next to very uh, less dense air. So it gives you great resolution between those structures. Um, also the inner ear, the otic capsule, very dense sclerotic bone. It gives us great detail of the, the, that bony um, anatomy of the inner ear. So the clinical things that, that really kind of go along with this first is conductive hearing loss, um, cholesteatoma, um, uh, is, is great to evaluate with CT. Um, infection, trauma, otosclerosis, and we can use it for operative planning as well. Now let's go through each of these and just talk about um, them in detail. Now I'm gonna talk about a lot of clinical entities here. I'm not gonna get into the details of that. All these things can even deserve their own hour lecture, but I just wanna just briefly touch on some certain clinical um, scenarios and, and talk about the modalities and why they're good. Uh, for it. So CT, often for CT um, or for conductive hearing loss, we're going to use a CT. So conductive hearing loss, as you guys all well know, that is something often physically wrong in that chain of conduction um, from the EAC, the tympanic membrane, to the ossicles, and to the oval window. Um, so something often is mechanically wrong. And so often, because it's all made of bones and air, CT is a really, really good way of evaluating this. We should usually always find a problem. Now I tell my trainees, if you have a CT for conductive hearing loss and you do not see an abnormality, you probably should save it, not sign that report, go for a walk, go read some other studies, do something else, come back to it and look again. Um, and you shouldn't ever feel too comfortable with a negative CT temporal bone for a conductive hearing loss indication. Now it does happen, um, but we usually should be able to find a problem since it is something mechanical along that chain. Here's two examples of, of a, a typical thing that we see uh, for a conductive hearing loss, a patient that has a longstanding history of chronic ear disease. On your left, you can see a coronal CT through the temporal bone. The middle ear is completely opacified. The ossicles are just really kind of hard to make out, but they're there, they're lumpy, they're bumpy. Um, on the same clinical process as on your image on your right, again, the middle ear is completely opacified. We're up at the level of the attic. The mastoids are all opacified. And again, we see this amorphous kind of calcified, um, dense material in the, in the attic next to the ossicles. And this is two examples of tympanosclerosis, um, just that chronic inflammatory healing process um, within the middle ear that has caused exuberant calcifications laying down of the mineralization and has caused that acicular chain to not work well. Clestiotoma um, is another common thing that we um, use CT for. Um, Clesteotoma, you know, is squamous epithelium where it doesn't want to be. And when that squamous epithelium gets someplace it doesn't want to be, it does what it, it is programmed to do, produces keratin, and the keratin debris gets trapped. Then that induces an inflammation, a lot of cytokines, and then subsequently the bone ar around it gets eroded. And since bone erosion is such a, an integral part of what a cholesteatoma does, CT is going to be excellent for this. So this case on the left, this is a coronal CT image. You can see that um, the region of the pars flaccida, the top of the tympanic membrane right here, appears retracted up into this lateral epitympanic recess. There's soft tissue or um, just a, a dense, a non-calcified density that's up in the attic and the epitympanum, and that blunt, the scutum is blunted here. And so this is a very common appearance of an acquired uh, pars flaccida type cholesteatoma. Over here is a pars tensa type where you've kind of lost the mid inferior 
portion of your tympanic membrane. It's very thickened. You see this soft tissue thickening within the mesotympanum, kind of along that medial wall of the middle ear cavity. It's tough to show on just a single image, but there was some bone erosion of the incus and stapes associated with this. And this was a pars tensa cholesteatoma. So again, cholesteatoma, the bone erosion is such an integral part of it. CT is a great way of looking at this. Infection, uh, we do a lot of temporal bone imaging for infection. Most of the time out of the ER, um, and it's the, the indication that we get is rule out mastoiditis. Well, middle ear and mastoid fluid is, is really nonspecific. Um, just because you have fluid in your middle ear and mastoid does not mean that's infected. And so often I, I feel like I'm turning that question back around to um, the referring physicians and say, you tell me if it's mastoiditis or not. Um, you know, most of the time this is related to uh, eustachian tube dysfunction, um, something else going on rather than infection. But when there's fluid there, that's when infection likes to, to, to set up. So I cannot tell if this fluid is infected or not unless there is bone erosion or coalescence. And so again, bone erosion, infection, um, coalescence, CT is going to be how you're going to want to image that. So in this case on your left, you can see um, in the left temporal bone, the middle ear mastoid completely opacified by itself wouldn't mean too much other than it is opacified, but we do see bone erosion of the mastoid septa, the posterior wall, the mastoid is gone as well. This would be highly concerning for a coalescent mastoiditis. This middle case, um, same, same patient on these. On the bone window, you can see this erosive process in the right mastoid. Just looking at that bone window, you may say, is this a mass or, or what is this a cholesteatoma? What's going on? The soft tissue window shows it's very low density fluid um, in that area of erosion. So this is probably a mastoid abscess. And there's also a superficial abscess on the other side in the uh, post-auricular scalp. And so uh, these things together with the bone erosion would lead us to say this is a coalescent mastoiditis that has spread um, to extracranially. Trauma, self-explanatory for CT, the fracture patterns are often complicated, um, so that high-resolution cortical detail is very optimal on CT. Example here on your left, you can see this fracture breaking through the cortex of the mastoid, propagating up through the middle ear. Too much space between the head and the malleus and the incus here. Again, that fine bony detail is very key to seeing this, and there's a, a disassociation of the malleus and incus here. Same thing on this coronal CT. Um, don't see the fracture line that well in this single image, but we could see patchy fluid. And again, uh, too much of a line between the malleus and incus on this coronal uh, image. And so this is another traumatic um, disassociation of the malleus and incus. Otosclerosis, um, the process that is the, the, where that very, very dense oto, oto capsule, one of the densest bones in the entire body, has been replaced, areas of it has been replaced with a less dense fibrovascular tissue. So, you know, I'm using the word density, CT is going to be a great way of looking at this. On the left, um, this is an example of fenestral otosclerosis, very, very subtle at times. You can see a very hazy decreased density just anterior to the region of the oval window. This one's a little bit higher than that, but this is an example of fenestral otosclerosis. It's that change in density that's gonna give our imaging findings. Here's where it becomes retrofenestral or cochlear. Now you can see this very dense otocapsule has been replaced with less dense bone all the way around it. And uh, it would be compatible with an otosclerosis. We can use CT for operative planning. Um, we do a lot of cochlear implants. And so um, measuring bone thickness, checking that operative path from the mastoid to the round window um, is, is very helpful to have a CT. Um, we can even use this much like the plain film that we saw earlier about post-implant localization. We can do some 3Ds to try to see the depth of insertion, um, its location within the cochlea. And so CT can be very helpful um, for uh, post-cochlear uh, implant uh, evaluation. All right, so that is CT in a nutshell. We're measuring density, the bones are what are key. And so most of the time that's that lateral aspect of the, the temporal bone, the, that conductive component plus the otic capsule. Now let's move on and talk about MRI where, where most of the um, 
most of the confusion is around and, and hopefully that I can give you some tools to really help you to get through these exams. And so in order to do that, we're going to take a small detour and we're going to get off kind of talking about the different clinical entities. And unfortunately, I'm going to talk a little bit about physics. Um, I'm going to try not to talk too much about it. And I'm trying not to bore you or confuse you, but I think understanding some very, very basic physics goes a long way into understanding what you're looking at. Now, MRI is like a lot of things in life. One of those topics of the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know anything about it. Um, so I, I feel like even myself, many years into this career, I am still learning all the time about the physics of MRI. There's a lot of great resources out there. Um, YouTube has a, a fantastic um, MRI physics education. But if you look at this, this is one that I think is really good. This is the basics video. All of them, eight to 10 minutes, is one of 56. Um, so you can see how complicated and how detailed this can get when you only are talking about basics. So MRI is complicated. So it's all right to feel a little uncomfortable about what's going on. But as long as we know the basics, then I think we can, we can get through. So how does an MRI actually uh, get acquired? What happens? So really it's in three very broad steps. And the, the, what those three steps are is within the name MRI itself, magnetic resonance imaging. And we're gonna walk through these. The first step is that magnet part. And we need to magnetize the patient. So what is a magnet? Well, you know, if you have a theoretical magnet with a North Pole, a South Pole, um, there's a, uh, this force that's applied uh, through the North Pole going back through the South Pole. Around it, we have those kind of curvy lines. Those are the field lines or flux lines. And so that's the path that a single North Pole would take if you put it next to this magnet. As you can see, these, the forces in the path is much shorter the closer you get. The farther out, the forces are weaker and the path is a little bit longer. Another basic point to point out that the strength of magnetic field is measured in the uh, unit Gauss. Um, you don't hear Gauss in medical imaging that much because Tesla is the unit of a thousand Gauss. So a 1.5 Tesla magnet is 1500 Gauss, a three Tesla magnet is 3000 Gauss. So our MRI is basically a giant magnet. And you can think of the bore of the machine where the patient is laying as being along that magnet with a north and a south pole and their body oriented along that. Now, this magnet is created because we have coils that go around that gantry, um, that bore. Um, they are super cooled. Um, and because they're kept at a super, super cool temperature, you can put a current through them, which in turn creates the magnetic field. And with the super cooled uh, coils, there's no resistance. And so that current goes through it uh, nonstop. There's no resistance. It will always be going. So that magnetic field is always on. Now this creates some significant safety issues for us. Um, trust me that uh, answering questions about MRI safety sometimes is um, boring and, and, and tedious, but it is a real thing that we really have to think about because um, this is one of the main reasons. One, it's strong. One, two, it's powerful. But three, it is always, always on. You can't flip a switch and turn the magnet off. So our MRI um, scanners have these same flux field lines as, as we talked about with normal uh, magnets. And, uh, you know, part of the issue with this is like those field lines we saw earlier, the forces are really kind of weak when you're far away from the scanner, but they ramp up exponentially the closer you get. And a lot of times by the time someone feels a pull on whatever is uh, ferromagnetic and being attracted by the machine, it's almost too late and they don't have the strength or control to keep it from flying into the machine. So keep this in the back of your mind anytime you are around an MRI machine or when you start talking about uh, the safety of imaging of things of like, cochlear implants, uh, brain stem implants, uh, metallic things in the body. There are very strong forces acting on these things. So now we've established the MRI machine is basically a giant magnet. Now we need to magnetize the patient. And what we take advantage of in MRI is hydrogen. It's very, very abundant in the body, um, all over the place in every single um, tissue and different concentrations and different formations. Um, hydrogen has a single proton and a single electron. Well, that helps us because that single electron 
creates a magnetic vector, a vector of force. Now, when the patient is outside the scanner, all our um, protons are just, or, or hydrogen um, atoms are just, um, the electrons are floating around randomly, so we're not magnetized. Everything just kind of cancels out. The forces are extremely, extremely weak. However, when we put the patient in the MRI scanner, those spins, those electrons, especially in hydrogen, energy preference is to line up with the magnetic field. If they go against it, then that's an energy um, neutral or negative type situation. And so the vast majority of these hydrogen um, uh, electrons will line up in the magnetic field. Now we have created a basis where we can start manipulating them and get information out. So when the hydrogen is lined up in that magnetic field, it doesn't just sit there static and just point down the barrel of the MRI. It actually spins and has this wobble, um, a resonance to it. And um, on this diagram on your right, you can see this green line. We can think about this as going down the barrel of that MRI. And these are the hydrogen uh, vectors of energy. They kind of spin around where that the vector is going down the bore. We know what the frequency of the spin is, and this is called the Lamore frequency. Not important for you to know, but it's important for the concept of how we actually get information out because we understand exactly what this frequency is. Everything has a natural frequency. A swing's frequency is set by the length of the swing. And as the man in this picture, if he pushes at the same frequency uh, that is natural to this the swing, then he will add energy and he can uh, push uh, the, the child higher and higher. You can imagine if he pushes in a frequency opposite of what this natural structure has, he's going to cancel out energy and the kid's going to go nowhere. Same things with glass. There's a natural frequency. And if someone matches that, the pitch of that frequency, they can add energy and break a glass. This even happens in structures. This was a bridge in Washington state many years ago that uh, the wind going down a ravine uh, matched the frequency that the bridge had. It added energy and the bridge ended up falling apart. So all this has to be accounted for in construction and architecture these days. So now that we know that we can add energy if we match the resonant frequency of hydrogen. Okay, so here, the z-axis is what's going down the bore of the MRI. So here is the net vector when they're just the patient in the, the bore at rest. We can add a radio frequency pulse that comes in at this frequency and add energy and knock it out of that uh, plane. Now it's perpendicular to the magnetic field. These things will start spinning around and they all want to go back to where they are at. And that's what we're basically doing is we're knocking them out of their energy preferred position. And then we're listening to what happens after that, that occurs. So just another example with a patient um, on it, the patient goes into the MRI scanner, they're magnetized, the net vectors of those energies are going along the scanner. We give the radio frequency pulse to match the Lamore frequency, that magnetization flips perpendicular and starts spinning around. And then we have things outside the patient, which are called coils. And that's what's actually listening to these, uh, these energy vectors as they're spinning around and actually um, gathering the data. Okay, so that is the, the basics of magnetic and, and mag, the magnetic step and the resonance step. Now let's move on to the last step is imaging. So what does this all mean for imaging? Well, those spin behaviors after we flip it into that perpendicular plane, um, behave differently. And there's two different things that we can pull out of that information. One is called T1 and the other is T2. T1 in short, very basically, is the time it takes to get back to where it wanted to be, back down that vector along the bore. So you can see this is, we've got it given the radio frequency pulse, and then they're all trying to get back to where they're at. And different tissues have different properties. And so if we image or we listen right here, we can assign this a certain grayscale color, this a certain grayscale color, then you have a T1 weighted image. T2, a little bit more complicated, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but this is the degree of transverse magnetization. So the, the degree of magnetization in that perpendicular plane. 
So when we give the radio frequency pulse, it's very high, and then it decays over time. And again, if we image right here, we can assign grayscale colors to this and to this and get T2 information out. Now you may look at this and say, well, they're just inverse of each other. They're just the opposites. They're actually truly independent things. Um, T1 properties and T2 properties are separate from each other and they exist at the same time. And the analogy I often use, it's like height and weight. Your height and weight exists at all times. It just depends how you measure it. Um, are you getting the weight information? Are you getting the height information? And it's the same thing with the T1 and T2. All right, so if you've made it that far, we're out of the physics, okay? So um, now we're gonna start about talking a little bit more clinically apical um, uh, facts about these T1 and T2 weighted imaging. And I'm gonna start with T1. So what does T1 look like when we get an MRI? Well, the thing that is the absolute brightest on most of all of our scans is fat. So um, there's not a ton of fat in the temporal bone. Uh, there is along the scalp, the ear, um, but you're going to get very high resolution characterization because of that fat um, wherever it is. Muscle is typically an intermediate gray and fluid is dark. So we can see this image. The CSF that's over here by the ponds is dark. Um, fat is super bright. We should be fairly comfortable. This is a T1 weighted image. Because the fat is very bright, it leads to the, our best anatomic imaging, especially when we start talking about things in the neck outside the temporal bone. Those soft tissues, the subcutaneous fat, um, really gives us really good anatomic imaging. Um, however, it kind of has limited use in the temporal bone um, because of that lack of fat. And you know, most of the temporal bone is bone and air. And so we don't get a ton out of it. Um, it is good for evaluating the marrow in the skull base, so especially the petrous apex. If it is not pneumatized, it has fatty marrow in there. That fat is very bright, as you can see in this patient. And so um, this is very helpful to know if something is in the marrow or not. The other thing T1 is very, very helpful for, other than just kind of anatomic localization, is there's not very much on a T1 image that is bright. And so if you see bright signal, it can only really be one of about um, five things, six things if you include gadolinium. One is fat, we've already talked about that. Gadolinium um, effects causes things to be bright on T1. So all our post-contrast imaging is usually T1 weighted. Um, blood products, blood products are often T1 bright. Protonaceous fluid, when you don't have simple fluid, inspissated secretions can get T1 bright. Melanin um, can be T1 bright. So um, melanin-rich melanomas can be T1 bright. Um, however, melanomas is pretty variable how much melanin it has in it. Um, the other thing, uh, just to throw in passing, that you'll see on brain imaging is uh, the posterior pituitary is bright because the vasopressin in the posterior pituitary is naturally T1 bright. But most of the time, when I'm seeing an MRI, I'm thinking, and I see bright signal on T1, I'm thinking, is this fat or blood? Is these usually the two things that I, I'm thinking about the most? So if I look at this lesion that's in the temporal bone, it's in kind of the area of the middle ear mastoid, very, very T1 bright. I have to ask myself, is this a giant lipoma or is this blood products that is loculated and expansile within the middle ear? And this, this was a case of cholesterol granuloma. And so that T1 signal is very, very key for me to make that diagnosis. A brief uh, discussion on um, gadolinium. It's a rare earth metal, renal, renally secreted. We always worry about um, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. It's really the newer uh, the formulations of gadolinium, it's very, very uh, unlikely. Actually, there's been no reported cases. So we're, we're easing up on our renal requirements for MRI. If we think if someone needs contrast, we're gonna give it to, no matter what their renal function is. Um, in the brain around the temporal bone, the, the gadolinium is a macromolecule, so it doesn't really cross the blood brain barrier. Um, so intracranial, you don't see a ton of enhancement outside of the vessels. However, in the temporal bone, it's important to re remember that the geniculate and postgeniculate um, facial nerve does have a rich venous plexus around it. And so you will see normal enhancement in the facial nerve in those locations. Mm -hmm. Now, as it gets back through the labyrinthine and into the uh, IAC, then you shouldn't see much enhancement at all. The other thing that's in the temporal bone that can enhance normally is mucosa. Mucosa is normal vascular tissue. And so enhancement within the EAC, middle ear, mastoids, uh, often I don't get too worked up about. Moving on to T2, um, 
T2 signal intensities compared to T1 fat is still bright. It's not quite as bright as it was on T1. Uh, muscle still intermediate gray. The big thing on T2 is fluid is now bright. So you can see all this CSF within the fourth ventricle uh, around the cerebellum is extremely bright. And so really a lot of times what we're, we're looking at here is fluid, um, either looking at structures in the fluid, especially around the temporal bones, or the fluid content within a mass. And this is a giant meningioma that's along the posterior aspect of the temporal bone. We can see this meningioma is causing mass effect and there's bright signal within the middle cellular peduncle. So that's edema. Um, so T2, we're really concerned about fluid. All right, so that is the basics. T1, T1 post contrast, T2. Everything else in MRI is built on top of those sequences. So if you really understand those sequences, you're going to understand much of what we do. Now, just as a reminder, we look at this CT, normal CT over here. Most of the temporal bone, we see nothing on MR. We don't get really much signal out of those bones, out of the air spaces, out of the ossicles. And so much of the temporal bone is kind of a black hole. And really what we're going to be focusing on on MRI is the inner ear structures and IAC. All right, so just quick... Um, summary, T1 um, anatomic detail is really good, especially extracranial um, around the ear, around that fat. Fatty marrow is also uh, well evaluated. There's very limited uh, differential for things that are bright on T1, and we use it for contrast. T2, really fluid. You gotta just think T2 means fluid, and a lot of times in um, the ear, we're thinking about the IAC and the inner ear. So let's move on and talk about some of the clinical scenarios that it's best to, to image with MRI. And the, the clinical scenarios is not all exhaustive, but the ones we're gonna talk about is sensual narrow hearing loss, cholesteatoma, infection, vestibular symptoms, and treatment planning, again. All right, sensual narrow hearing loss. Now we talked about conductive hearing loss being a problem with that outer kind of bony physical chain. Now we have a problem with the, the nerve either picking up um, the, the, the stimulus um, going through the, the inner ear or a transmittance of that uh, nerve impulses to the brainstem. So we're going to be looking at the inner ear, cranial nerves, and brainstem. As opposed to the conductive hearing loss, where I said nobody should be very happy about seeing a negative uh, CT for conductive hearing loss, I almost usually um, expect a, a negative sensual narrow hearing loss MRI. You know, the most common cause of sensual narrow hearing loss is old age, presbycusis. Um, and so, you know, that is, has no imaging findings. However, since there is a small chance of a potential treatable cause of sensual narrow hearing loss, especially an asymmetric sensual narrow hearing loss, um, that is why we do a lot of MRI imaging to look for that. But it's a, it's a smaller percentage of those patients. So most of the time, um, the, the imaging is going to be normal. And here's what it looks like. T2 weighted image, we could see that the fluid is bright. Um, we get excellent contrast of those nerves coursing from the brainstem, the seventh and eighth cranial nerve complex from the pontomedullary junction through the cellular pontine angle cistern into the IAC and eventually into the inner ear structures. We also see that fluid signal that's within the cochlea vestibule semicircular canals as well. So it gives us a good um, evaluation of those inner ear components. Now, I just want to take just a brief moment and talk about some of the um, fluid sensitive sequences that we use in IAC imaging. Um, two of the common ones you'll see is uh, KISS space. Now those are vendor um, specific names. So KISS is also known as Fiesta on certain machines. Space is also known as Cube on um, some machines. And they're not always T2. Um, even though you look at it, you say fluid's bright, you just told me that. The KISS Fiesta is what messes that up. It is a very complicated sequence. It's a mixture of T1 and T2 that is weighted so the fluid is really bright. So it looks like a T2, but if I saw something bright in the ponds, I wouldn't be able to say that's T2 hyperintense because it could potentially be T1 hyperintense as well. Space cube, on the other hand, is a T2 weighted image. And so this is, if I see something in the ponds here, I know this is going to be um, T2 hyper intense. So, so just keep this in the back of your mind. A lot of times I refer to these as fluid sensitive sequences and not necessarily as thin T2s. Now, I much prefer space cube, um, so I prefer them to be T2, but that is not always what we get or what we use. These are very high resolution, usually limited field of view, but we can get very, very thin slices on this so we can see those nerves as they course all the way through um, their course. 
Um, there are also 3D. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what this means, but it means that we can actually reformat these into different planes. Not all MRI sequences you can. These we can. So, um, for example, if you want to look at the orientation of um, the four main nerves in the IAC, you can reformat these images into those um, different ways. So we get a really good evaluation of the nerves, blood vessels, and the inner ear fluid. So this is the one patient had a vestibular schwannoma, um, same patient, two different sequences. You can kind of see the difference between the KISS and the space on this image. I prefer space, but um, KISS is, is perfectly workable as well. So since you're not hearing lots, what do we see when we find something? Well, you can see a schwannoma, as we just said. It's the most common thing um, that we see. This is the thing we're evaluating for in patients with asymmetric sensor near hearing loss. Um, since there's vessels there, you could potentially get an aneurysm as it's pretty rare. You can see um, this is a T2 weighted image and this big dilated AIGA branch that kind of courses back near the IAC and potentially could um, affect those nerves involved in hearing. Labyrinthitis, now we're moving to the inner ear structures. If we just look at this coronal T2 weighted image, we see nice normal fluid signal in both cochlea. You can kind of see those turns of the cochlea bilaterally. But if we look at post contrast, we can see this left side all enhances uh, where the right side doesn't. And remember that blood brain barrier, um, often we, we should not see enhancement within the inner ear structures. And so this is um, compatible with labyrinthitis. All right, moving on cholesteatoma. So we already talked about cholesteatoma under CT. Remember bone erosion was kind of the key there. However, that is not entirely specific and sensitive to cholesteatoma. What if you have a small lesion, you're unsure if you see uh, bone erosion. Um, what if you had a previous surgery for cholesteatoma and you've got residual soft tissue thickening there and you're trying to decide on imaging, is this from the surgery or is this new erosion? So CT is not the all, end all be all for, for cholesteatoma. And here's a, an example case. So in that right temporal bone, you can see some opacification up near the attic mastoid antrum, um, just kind of feeling maybe it's wide and it's kind of tough to tell in this single CT. Um, so it was recommended to get an MRI. MRI, look at this, it's T2 bright, not really telling us very much on the T2. The T1 also, I can't really get any more information out of that. So, so what is the use of MRI if these sequences that I just talked about aren't really giving us any information? Well, the MRI value in cholesteatoma is diffusion weighted imaging. So I'm going to just briefly talk about what DWI is, and I'm going to use a brain example. So excuse me for that, but I think it, it explains it the best. Diffusion weighted imaging is basically tracking the movement of those hydrogen uh, atoms through fluid or through whatever it's in and tracking how much can it move. So in that top left, the normal situation, there's cells, there's an extracellular space, that proton can move. It has some limitation of the structure that's there, but it can move around. At the bottom, where if, say if there's a lot of edema within the tissues and now those cells are kind of pressed out or pressed apart, now it has much more freedom to move around. It has much more diffusion capabilities. In the, the scenario that we commonly talk about, um, DWIs and stroke, and the cells die, they swell, they get big. Now that extracellular space is basically gone, and that that uh, hydrogen um, part cannot move very much. It is limited in how much it can diffuse. Or if you're just in fluid, then it can go anywhere it wants to. So what does this mean? We're basically tracking a T2 signal on, a, on an image, and we're basically pulling it with magnetic gradients. We're basically pulling it left, right for a little while. We'll stop, we'll pull it head foot for a little while. We'll stop, we'll pull it obliquely for a little while. You can imagine as things that are freely diffusible will track along where that magnetic gradient is pulling it. And as it moves, it starts losing T2 signal. Okay. So CSF, freely movable, freely diffusible. So it's the T2 signal is very high, remember fluid sensitive sequence, but as it moves, it loses that signal because it's moving a lot. Uh, if we think about just the brain here, the, you know, we have some structure, we have some cellularity in the gray matter, we have the axons, there is interstitial space, things can move, but it just can't lose as much as CSF. And so if we look at the very beginning, the image that we acquire is a T2 image, the fluid is bright. If we stop right in the middle, 
of this process of these different gradients being turned on, now everything's kind of the same signal. And once we get to the very end, this is the final diffusion weighted image that we commonly look at where the CSS has lost all of that signal. The brain has lost some, but not quite as much. So this is what we're, what we're doing when we're doing a diffusion weighted signal or uh, image. Every DWI comes with an ADC and the ADC is the slope of these lines. And so the CSF, that slope is very high. It lost a lot of signal. And so it's assigned a high value. The ADC is actually a quantitative map where we can measure um, how much signal was lost on the ADC. So let's look at this in a clinical scenario. Again, this is brain. We're gonna use stroke as an example and come back um, to cholesteatoma. And so this is the case where now we have restricted diffusion. Something cannot move at all, so it is not losing any signal. And if we look where this is at, um, the restricted diffusion, um, the area has edema in it. It's bright on the T2 image that we start. And if we go all the way to the end, now the CSF has lost all their signal. The brain's lost some, but not all. And this has not lost any signal at all. So it stays very bright. And if we look at the slope of this, this area has not changed at all. So it shows up black. This is true restricted diffusion. So outside of stroke of what we talk about most of the time, what other things can restricted diffusion um, mean? Well, hypercellularity, a very cellular tumor, such as lymphoma, all those cells packed in together often will show restricted diffusion. And in our case, cholesteatoma, that keratin debris that is packed in to the center of that cholesteatoma, the sheets of keratin, very organized and packed in tightly, doesn't allow for that hydrogen to diffuse. And so these often have restricted diffusion. So if we go back to our example case of kind of the non-specific CT findings, the T1 and T2 that doesn't help us that much. If we look at diffusion weighted imaging, we'll see very bright signal corresponding right to where that was in the um, attic and mastoid. And we see dark on the ADC. This is restricted diffusion. This would be um, pretty diagnostic for a cholesteatoma. So you can see the benefits of diffusion weighted imaging in cholesteatoma. Um, moving on infection, we've already talked about the coalescent aspect of infection on CT. Now, if there is no coalescence, how do you know if something's infected or not? Uh, for me, basically on imaging, it's if I see signs of infection outside of the temporal bone. So here's a giant temporal lobe abscess extending up from a completely opacified um, uh, mastoid. On the right, you know, just looking at the mastoid, I would not be able to say that's infected or not, but with an abscess sitting on top of it, I'm going to say it's infected. Vestibular symptoms. Um, how, what do we do for vestibular symptoms? Well, I feel like we image a lot um, with MRI for vestibular symptoms really has a very low yield of abnormalities on routine MR. Um, you know, it, the, the vestibular sy system, the endolymphatic system is, is really below the resolution that we typically see on routine MR. So, you know, we don't very often see very much. However, is there a role for endolymphatic imaging? And I think this is um, up for debate. At UCLA, we do a lot of this. Um, so I just wanted to talk about it real quick. Um, but, you know, there are techniques in special MRI things that we can do to take a look at those endolymphatic spaces. So just as a reminder, before we look at the imaging, um, within your otic capsule, you have fluid that is just deep to the otic capsule. This is perilymph. And then you have those membranous structures inside that perilymph that is filled with endolymph. They're both fluid. They both look T2 bright to us when we look at it on MRI. However, they're made up of, of different um, contents. Their, their perfusion is slightly different and we can take advantage of this on MRI. If we just look specifically at one of the turns in the cochlea, the endolymphatic space that we're interested in is here, the cochlear duct or the scala media. So what do we see on MR? Well, we figured out that we can give contrast into somebody's arm and wait four hours and then it gets into the perilymphatic spaces. So in those spaces around um, the, the inner ear structures. So basically what we're doing is we're getting a subtraction image. So everything that's bright is perilymph. Everything that is dark is endolymph. Now, this is what the source data looks like. Good luck looking at that and telling me what you see. It's, it's very faint. It's hard to see. Um, but this is two sides in the same patient. This is normal. This is abnormal. 
to help us look at this better, we do some fancy MRI tricks and we do a subtraction image, which basically makes everything bright, the perilymph, and everything dark, the endolymph. So you can see on this cochlea right here, not very much um, dark. You don't really see much at all. This is probably the normal saccule uh, within the vestibule. Here's on the side that has too much fluid in the endolymph um, and it shows up very, very dark. So this would be an endolymphatic high drops of the cochlea. So there is a debate on the clinical utility. If this is worth it, it had people sit around for four hours to pay for an entire MRI um, for this, but you can get some information out of it. What does it mean? we're still kind of working on, but we do this a ton at UCLA, probably one of the highest volume centers in the country that does this endolymphatic imaging. Treatment planning, um, you know, certain things MR is better for for treatment planning than the CT, um, you know, following masses, following tumors, radiation planning here, we've, we've contoured out to bilateral vestibular schwannomas and a neurofibromatosis type two patient, we can track volumes, um, we can help um, plan the radiation, as I said. Um, here's a child that had a congenital sensual narrow hearing loss, we've done that fluid sensitive sequence, we've um, reformatted it to go down the barrel of the IAC, where we're looking for those four nerves to make sure the cochlear nerve is present. And on here, you can see a clear facial nerve, your superior and inferior vestibular, but not much of a cochlear nerve at all. And it may um, have some implications to treatment. Um, so we do this uh, at times as well. All right. So hopefully, um, through this talk, I, I haven't put you to sleep, I haven't frustrated you or confused you, but I just wanted to give you some very basic tools to think about CT and MRI and how to apply that to the clinical scenarios that you often see. So let's wrap this up with some take home points. CT is just a big, dumb density measuring machine. It knows nothing else other than the densities. So that is very, very good for bones and all the part of the temporal bone um, that is just bones and air, CT is going to be your workhorse. Um, CT is going to be the main workhorse for conductive hearing loss. And we need to find an abnormality almost every time we image somebody for that. And so your radiologist, whoever it is, needs to work really hard to find something um, uh, on these studies and not just blow it off as I don't see anything wrong. MR is really good for characterizing the softer things to give us data about the soft tissues around it. So um, external to the ear, the inner ear, the IAC, the marrow space, this is what MRI is really, really good for. Um, we went over the basics of T1, T1 with contrast and T2. They give you different info, different data, um, but hopefully you remember some of these basics and uh, you can use that when you look at your studies to be able to realize I'm looking at a T1, this is what I'm looking for. Or if I'm looking at a T2, this is what I'm looking for. MRI is the workhorse for sensual narrow hearing loss. There's a very low percentage of abnormalities on those exams. Um, but remember, we're really focusing on the, the nerves the, the path of the nerves and the inner ear structure, the very fluid sensitive um, areas or flu fluid filled areas within the temporal bone. Um, again, those fluid sensitive sequences, those very thin ones, the KISS Fiesta or the Space Cube are the workhorse for sensual narrow hearing loss. Um, there is some literature saying that maybe that's all you really need to, to get an initial screening evaluation on these people. That's up for debate, um, but that's where you're gonna spend most of your time on those images for sensual near hearing loss. And we went over some basics of the physics of diffusion weighted imaging and how it applies to cholesteatoma that tightly packed in keratin debris does not let fluid to freely diffuse through it. It traps it in there. And so they show up as diffusion bright and ADC dark, and that can help you in your diagnosis of cholesteatoma. If the diagnosis is uncertain on CT or if there's postoperative and it's hard to tell which is surgical change versus bone erosion. All right, so that's, I'm gonna wrap that up. Um, again, very basic, very, you know, 10,000 foot overview, but hopefully this will give you a basis and uh, help you be more comfortable in some of the imaging studies that you'll see. So thank you very much. My email address is there too. Anybody has any questions, comments or anything, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm, I'm in this field to collaborate and to be and work with other people. Um, and, and so I, I enjoy um, interacting. So please reach out if you do have any questions. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. 
To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.